Welcome back to season four, part two. I'm back in the studio. We are live Wednesday night, 9 p.m. I'm excited to be here. And I want to just let you all know, if you want more content like you've seen on the Al Nicoletti show, whether it's the show, whether we're talking about probates, partitions, and all the weird and wacky things in the title world, make sure you check out the Instagram, the Facebook page, the YouTube channel. We're going to put the link tree right there. We got the link tree. Just scan the QR code and you'll find all that stuff. And uh, I hope you enjoy the episode tonight with Tyler Austin because this is the kind of people, these are the people we want on the show that can provide the value to you all out there. And I just want to say welcome back team. Mike, welcome back. Taylor, we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, I'm ready to go. I got my notes out and I know that the audience is out there. I love it. People already commented, commenting on the show. So let's rock this thing. Hey, everybody. My name is Al Nicoletti. I'm an attorney here in Florida, and welcome to the Al Nicoletti Show, where I bring on real estate super investors, rising rock stars, movers and shakers, and leaders of clubs in their communities that educate, entertain, and inspire all things on Florida real estate. And I bring on the best in the industry that can really hone in on the niches in the real estate world, in the entrepreneur world, whether we're talking about mindset or we are getting into all the other creative worlds in the real estate world, whether it's Airbnb, land, commercial, you name it, we cover it. We bring on the guests on how you can take your company to the next level. On my show today, I bring back a banger. This guy is electric. I love talking to Austin. Uh, Tyler Austin, all the time. Tyler, he was on my show, maybe episode four. Uh, I think it was episode four on season one. And I remember distinctly that after I hopped off the episode with Tyler, that my mind just went, whoa. It was it was a monumental shift for me in the podcasting of what I was trying to do with the real estate and, and explain to people and talk to people and be a host. And uh, it's funny because at the time, Tyler and I, I we kind of talk about this once in a while, but like when I did the episode, for some reason, I messed up the episode with the Zoom and I unpinned my camera. So anytime Tyler talked, it was just him. And anytime I talked, it was just, it was like a blank screen and we never saw like each other on. It was crazy. So I really wanted Tyler back on this episode, one, because he's totally crushing it right now with the CRM and the marketing with REI Sift. That is his baby. That's his brand. That's the company. And he's crushing it because so many investors out there use his software and use and leverage it to get deals and market and use it to keep up with cold and hot leads. And from the time I had Tyler on, so much has changed in the last three years from what he's worked on, what's happened in his life. And I really want to get in that because we're going to talk about things like what the difference is between real estate and sales when it comes to marketing and niche sequential marketing and following up and tracking your costs and tracking everything. So I really wanted Tyler on because I want you all to know that I bring on the best, and right here is the best. So without further ado, let's welcome him on the show. Tyler, I love it, man. Love seeing you. What's up, man? Dude, you uh I mean, you crushed that. That, that I don't know how are are you you have you have to be reading something or or and if you are, it's like, man, you're like perfect. I would have just stumbled. There would have been a ton of F bombs in that. You crushed it, man. Thank you. Thank you, man. No, I, I mean every word because every time we talk, when we met for the first time, uh, I mean, it, it was crazy. I mean, we, we've talked for over four years now, connecting on Facebook, on the show, and, and I see you at the event. So I'm happy for you to be here. Tyler, I want you to tell everybody from the last time you and I did the episode, because that, at that episode, we talked about incomplete data and spreadsheets and how people can tackle that. If you missed that episode, still a gem of an episode when it comes to incomplete yeah data data but since then last three years catch us up what's happened in your life what's happened with rei sif like what's been going on the last three years uh it means a, sh a ton has changed right um i mean i think when we talked last on the podcast um i was in my home office i believe 
I don't think we had an office building for SIP yet. Um, and um, so that's one big thing. Uh, obviously, we have an office building now. Uh, from an employee standpoint, I think uh, back then we only had like three people maybe, you know, uh, not very many. And we don't have very many now, too. I think we're at like 25 or something like that. Um, so so that's... Um, you know, we, we're lean and mean, you know, like we like to teach real estate investors, if you will, um, and just kind of enjoy the journey. Um, since then, also, I added a baby into my life. So that's a big thing. I have my two-year-old son now. So about a year afterwards, I guess we were working on him right around when we were on the show, if that, if those, if that uh, adds up. Um, yeah, somewhere around that, that December, I would guess. Congratulations on that, by the way. That's great. Thanks, man. Um, he's super amazing. Uh, my daughter, you know, she's grown like crazy. And, and when you talk about like business and life and everything else in the last three years, the biggest thing that I've gained from it outside of growth in business, which, um, you know, thank most of all is from my team, you know, more than anything, um, it, it is really just my ability to become more in tune with my family and stuff has been really the biggest thing for me. You know, um, I also was like, well, I was like 30 pounds heavier. You were probably a bit more than that, maybe. But if no one know him back then, like, like, like both of us have lost weight. So there's that. Uh, man, a lot has changed, man. A lot has changed. Um, you know, the business wise, you know, back then we talked a lot about incomplete data. Um, and, and that was because that was the biggest problem prevalent in the industry in that moment. And it's still a really big problem. It was a really, you know, big hot point for me was getting people to understand, you know, um, it's, it's about managing the data. It's about getting the, the data in, you know, somewhere centralized, getting out that incomplete stuff and focusing on the clean stuff and just being a little bit more hygienic with your data. Over the last three years, REI SIFT itself has evolved into so much more than that. I mean, a, a ton more from like a full, you know, full CRM with that component involved. Um, and uh, and it's really just become, you know, uh, a really amazing community. And it was a really, you know, amazing community back then. But now it's like, you know, it's like if, if you hear someone that uses REI SIFT, you think of that person differently than if you hear, you know, they're using like, I don't know, call tools or ready mode or any other tool in the real estate industry, right? Or, or any other CRM, like you, right. you identify with that person as somebody that is a certain kind of way. And I think that's something really powerful about what, you know, my team and, and what the community has built is the ability to, um, to create not only just the product, but the culture around the type of person that's in the type of business that runs and operates off of off of sift and um and so that's super amazing um that's the word that's uh by the way that's the word that i would say like that best describes rei sift is the culture like i yeah. i mean like when you think rei sift you think they're about certain people in that group like you got yeah. mark and dom you got jimmy fuentes you got uh gabriel in there you have stephanie shepherd i mean there's like certain yeah. staple people that you think of and that's just what it's been it's it's its own community it's not just a random facebook group it's you created a community you created that culture and yeah. that's just thriving yeah man and it's and it's interesting because like it used to have a stigma sifted where it was only the place you go if you're cheap right if you want to like spend a little bit of money right and it's crazy like now or especially you know on the late end of covid and in in the market that's that we're in now um, what we've learned is, is, uh, that now bigger real estate investors, right? We have, you know, real estate companies doing, you know, eight figures a year using SIF where, you know, then it's just kind of, it's interesting because we have those people that will still say that. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, this company, this company, this company, yeah, they, they use SIF too. And they're like, oh, wow, really? Like, yeah. Uh, because you're, what, what, what you're running into is the typical trap. Uh, where you're assuming what you understand is truth because of something you heard over here or the one video you heard seen or the one clip on Instagram or whatever. And you're allowing yourself to be naive. And, and, you know, I, I always like to say, and being naive is, you know, the, you know, the bane of demise in business for CEOs, right? Like you got to really have an open mind and understand and try to, to really, um, uh, I don't know, get into the weeds of your business and be vulnerable, right? Like understand that you don't know everything and neither do I. Um, but what I do know is, is simple numbers, right? Um, math is pretty easy in elementary school. And, 
Um, and so I try to stick to um, letting people understand the simple numbers that, you know, if you start using SIFT, then you'll have these results. And, and so that's what's kind of brought on some of those bigger guys. It's like they're doing massive cold calling and, you know, uh, and well, we're not going to get into that now. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can get into it later. We'll, we'll dive in on awesome. that. Um, w- one thing I do want to point out, because I thought it was just so powerful at a 10 growth, was just like how important it it was uh transitionally for you health wise to like make sure yeah. you you really honed in on that for yourself because that you know that's been a, a a little twist in season four about just really making sure that you know we could do business all day but making sure you your life your health's on track and i know like yeah. for you is a big game changer if you want to dive in on that yeah no i'm totally open to, to delving into that and so um you know, first and foremost, um, I've never thought of myself as an unhealthy person, right? I always thought that I was relatively healthy. Uh, but for a stint in my life there, you know, I definitely became what, you know, unhealthy, you know, I gained, you know, um, you know, 30 pounds or so in a matter of like eight or nine months or so I kind of went back. SIF tells the story, right? All the SIF videos, you can see like I'm relatively skinnier, you know, rel- right around where I'm at now. And then all of a sudden, my cheeks start getting a little bigger and then my beard's getting longer and I got a cigar in my mouth multiple times a day or whiskey on a live at, I was probably drinking whiskey when we were on our podcast, most likely, oh my God. um, you, you know, like but Tyler, it wasn't uncommon. But Tyler, I do remember the lives, like the live started with the smoke. I just remember yeah. that's how it started. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see it'd be a, there'd be smoke around me and, and don't get me wrong. So what happened? Let me, let me diagnose. So, so like, this is this is something that I hope I really hope if if you take anything from like my like th- th- this today this is like the most important thing for you to be able to do is to sit down and truly be honest with yourself and the reason why you're doing certain activities because we tend to really make excuses for ourselves on why we are doing what we're doing why we're not working out why we're not getting up in the morning why we're not you know, or why we are eating the way that we are. And what I told myself when I was uh, started smoking cigars and drinking whiskey was that I was really busy and I had a lot of stuff going on. And that was, I, I didn't do meditation and that was my form of such, right? Sitting down, smoking a cigar, talking to people, um, you know, that I, um, you know, that I, that I enjoy talking with and teaching people. It was like a form of meditation for me. Right. And, and really, that was an excuse. Right. That was an excuse to feel something that I otherwise could have achieved elsewhere that was in a more healthy fashion. But I chose this direction because of uh, of how easy it was and right, what, the, what, it, what it gave me. And I'm not saying smoking cigars is bad. Right. Or drinking whiskey is bad. Um, I you know, I haven't done it in about well, two two years, just over two years now, uh, whatever, July 30 first or something like that of 2021. But like, um, that doesn't mean that I don't think that, you know, I, I could, right. I, you know, I'm okay with taking a drink. I just, I probably never will because I don't need it no more because I found what, what was lacking there. Um, I found like since then, um, but what it took to find it, I wish I didn't have to go through. Right. Um, and so uh, I, I had got the, I'm going to try not to use the C word very, very much here due to, you know, boosting and stuff of the thing. But like uh, I got the C word in 2021, two weeks after my son was born. And um, and so it's it's like how far back do you go? Right. Like so. um, So just so people know a little bit more about my past, like, I, you know, I could give the whole sob story about my, you know, biological father and all that other stuff. Let's just skip all the sob story and just understand that my childhood was, was, you know, involved cop lights and, and two by fours and bad, you know, bad dad. Right. Um, So fast forward up to when my son's being born, I didn't realize the emotional effect that having a son, even though I already had a daughter would have on, on me as a man. Right. Uh, which most men won't ever talk about. I don't talk about, you know, um, the types of things in like females, you know, we know about females getting postpartum depression and things like that when kids are born. Well, men can get the same thing, right? Um, And I'm not saying necessarily that's what I had because there's definitely other things at play, um, but this was definitely a component. Like there was things from my childhood um, that I didn't understand that I was upset about. And, um, and so I never emotionally attached to my son, um, you know, up until about 
three days before he was going to be born. Uh, he was born on July 4th, by the way. I went into um, his bedroom, and as soon as like I, I had just got done drinking whiskey, smoking cigars, and I walk inside, it was like three o'clock in the morning, and uh, I just, that's two o'clock in the morning, and I, I broke down in, in his bedroom. Like I sat in the rocking chair that was sitting there, and I just bawled my eyes out. I was like, I don't know why. But I just I, I realized that I'm having a son and I just couldn't stop thinking, like, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to raise a son and turn him into a man when I never really necessarily felt like I had fully? I'm not going to say I didn't have that because my, my, who I consider my dad now, you know, you know, raised me well. Right. Um, but we didn't have growing up the kind of relationship that that um, I don't know, it's different. Right. It's just right. different than what was in my head. I can't I can't necessarily explain it, but. Um, nevertheless, okay. Now my son comes a few days later. I'm still pissed off at him because he ruined, I was smoking some ribs and some brisket ready for the next morning. And my wife comes out, we're going to the hospital. I'm like, damn it. So I didn't get to eat ribs and brisket for the first, I bought a brand new Traeger for it and everything, you know, $3,500 grill and, you know, ruined the first smoke, but nevertheless, blessing in disguise. Um, and, uh, well, he was a blessing in general. Um, and, and so he comes, Okay. Uh, two weeks later uh, or so, uh, we get COVID uh, or the C word. Uh, you can bleep out the COVIDs if it hurts your uh, pushing. I don't know. Um, so I get that, right? Totally fine through that. All right. Nothing affects me. I'm totally okay. Um, but I can't smell my son. I can't hold my son for whatever reason. Like since, he, you know, when he's in the hospital, yes. But like I pick him up and I get super dizzy. I'd have to sit down. Um, something was happening there. Um, and then, uh, so fast forward, um, you know, two weeks goes by, I'm, I'm feeling good, right. I'm feeling relatively okay. I still got head congestion. Everything's, you know, so, so, um, fast forward another like week and a half, two weeks, this is going into like late August. Um, I'm like starting to feel terrible. My gut gives out. I'm losing like a ton of weight every week, you know? Um, visibly, I don't look good. Uh, I just start going down like this health, like tank and, uh, my heart rate, super pounding. I was playing video games with my brother. This is like the very, the incident that, that like it went like that. Like it just changed, right. like my health went like down instantly. I was sitting in my office. I just got done raiding on final fantasy 14, uh, a realm reborn. It's my favorite, fuck, his favorite video game I was playing with my brother. We're, we're, we're farming Shiva. It's a trial and you know, it's intense, right? Like, like, I mean, as, as nerdy as it sounds like, like everyone has a role and a position and like, you, like it's like to the wire, you know, like we finally cleared this, this. And all of a sudden I say bye to my brother. I get up. Actually, no, it was in the middle. It was right after um, the fight. I didn't even say bye to my brother. Like, my heart just started pounding like crazy. And I was like dizzy. And I got up and I was walking. I was trying to hold on to stuff. And I get to my bedroom. I, I put my hand on my wife's uh, shoulder. And she, like, you know, she was already asleep forever ago. Um, and and she, like, kind of like mutters, What's going on? I go over to my bed and I try to lay down. And that makes it even worse. It feels like I just like drank worse than I've ever drank in my life. Um, and I've, thinking I'm having like a panic attack basically is what I'm thinking is going on. And I have at this, at this moment, I, I didn't know what my heart rate's supposed to be. You know, I didn't know any of these types of things. Right. And so I'm panicking because I'm panicking, you know, like I don't know what's going on and it's three o'clock in the morning, you know, or two in the morning, whatever it was. And so I go out in the living room and I sit on the couch and I'm just chilling out, sitting up a little bit more, trying to calm down. And finally, I get into my bedroom after about an hour or so. And I lay down and I go to bed. I'm like, that was super weird. Whatever, you know, it was just something. Well, no, that wasn't just something. The next morning, like it all just started happening. And so um, anyway, to fast forward, you know, um, I was in my office. I sent one of our users or flew one of the users in the office and they were tattooing this on me in the middle of that tattoo. Obviously, I have others. Right. Like, I don't have problems with tattoos. Um, ended up having to go into the ER, um, called on the ambulance in the middle of my tattoo and, um, and my heart rate went up to like 180, 190 or something like that. And, um, don't get me wrong. I'm relatively fortunate from people that I know I'm fortunate in my symptoms that I was having, uh, cause some people have it so much worse, but anyway, fast forward, um, you know, I'm learning some things, I'm educating myself I'm figuring out what's going on. I'm doing all these things. And uh, what's very interesting is, is as I was working on myself, getting better, the business was still like growing, but I wasn't in it as much. 
Like I left SIF for about eight months, six to eight months. I was very, very detached from SIF, solely really relied on the team and the business wow. kept growing. And I was like, okay, so I was learning some of the things that from a leadership perspective that I was doing wrong, right? Uh, but also a lot of the things that were that were already, because I already had these things in place because I was preaching them to real estate investors, I was doing in my own businesses. And like, because those were in place, I was going through this portion of my life that I would have never known how, what is, was going to happen, right? Much like anybody could experience some random thing just happening in their life that they never would have known ha would happen. And if you don't have the things in place, your business is just tank, right? right? And even before that, I used to always say, I was like, you, you don't have a business if, if you die tomorrow and the business doesn't keep running, right? I was quite literally feeling this real time. And it was a true thought in my mind. I was planning everything as if I was going to be dead. Um, and, and that brings a realization of what your priorities are in life at a whole nother level. When you think that you're just a healthy person and all of a sudden you realize that you have zero control over anything, you could be gone tomorrow. And so the decisions and where you put yourself and who you interact with today means everything. And it's changed the way that I run my businesses drastically of who I, you know, I don't do strategy calls at SIF no more, not because I don't want to, it's just that, um, I, I don't want to spend my whole day doing those actions because I know that tomorrow I could be gone. I'd rather spend time with my kids or I'd rather focus on something that I enjoy doing. Not that I don't, something that I love doing, not that I enjoy doing, because I do enjoy doing strategy calls and stuff, but you know, it's just, it's just putting myself in the right place. Right. And so anyway, fast forward, I found out that, um, the the immune system is a very tricky thing uh in your autonomic autonomic nervous system is directly associated with your immune system and everything in your body and there's two different sides of it there's the parasympathetic and sympathetic you know um, nervous system and they need to be like yin and yang they need to be like in the middle straight and narrow if they're here or here and they don't know how to control themselves your life is hell and um, uh, lots of things can affect this Ironically, mold is one of those things. And as real estate investors, what do we put ourselves around a lot in Florida in houses that have been vacant for a long time in hurricane conditions is mold. mold. Um, and so this was one of my things, right? So I have um, I had mold in my system, which does what? Um, well, for those that don't know, if you get a transplant, mold uh, is a natural you know source that's used to suppress your immune system so that you accept organs. Um, and so and mold in your system suppresses the immune uh, system and basically makes it hard for your system to recover. Um, and so I started doing a lot of detoxing. I learned that I had uh, mono kick up. I learned I had Lyme disease kick up. I had all these co-infections kick up in my system that were been sitting dormant. But because I was smoking, because I was super stressed out, because of my whiskey, most likely my wife says it's those things. I don't know. I was. I don't feel like I was doing it long enough for those to fully have an effect. But because of my lifestyle, because I was pushing myself, because while I had was sick with the C, I was still in here all day, right? Like 12 hours a day working. Like I should have been resting. I should have, I should have just chilled out, but I told myself like, I don't need to, but me 10 years ago and the stress levels that I have now compared to 12, 10, 10 years ago is, is totally different. So how I need to heal from sickness, uh, is different. Sickness is a stress on the body business is a stress on the body thoughts are a stress on the body and so your body responds to stress period it doesn't care if it's business you know sickness or whatever and so i didn't understand my stress load because i'm a man men are strong we don't get stressed right um and that was my mentality and so come to find out that wasn't true i was stressed out i was wanting people to succeed and because i was so attached to the user's success if they were failing and complaining that they weren't successful, I took it as like my problem and I'm getting stressed out because they're not successful and their problems. And so I stay on a call for three hours and I put myself in a bad position because of that. And, um, and I see this so often with like, like, like new investors trying to get deals because they're stressed out about having to close a deal. And so they make bad business decisions because of these stressors instead of doing the thing that's actually the right thing to fix the problem like go on the run or do the walk or work a part-time job while you're getting started in real estate like these things that put you in a better overall stress level this better position you don't have to love it but you know you can maintain the stress levels and so anyway you know fast forward i'm in a real a much better position i still deal with things now 
Um, but I learned so much from that, you know, and, and now I like to do analogies of the immune system, right? And how your business has an immune system. And a lot of times, you know, what we like to do is inject a bunch of vitamin C, aka cash into our problems, you know, but that only lasts so long, right? You can only push cash into your business to fix its problem until, you know, either you're, you, you run out of cash or cash doesn't fix the problem no more in your immune system in your business can't survive no more and it just tanks right and now you got to figure out what's the problem within the problem in your business and i had to figure out the same thing with me what's the problem within the problem i got mold i had 27 times the mercury limit in my body that was like just floating around right i had lyme disease a mono all these things that i had to slowly take care of in the right priority mm -hmm. um in order to get me back functioning where i need to be to even like be able to hold my son. I couldn't hold my son for eight months on nearly like without feeling sick. Crazy. My wife, my wife think like she's so damn strong. Like, um, it blows my mind. Cause she, while I was going through all this, like she was all, she had the C at the same time, but she still had the breastfeed and do all the things that she was doing. I was like, dude, like, how are you doing this? I am like KO'd. And so she is just the strongest person ever without her. Obviously, you know, um, I wouldn't be, uh, able to function and at all how I, I do, but you know, it's 50% of the show or whatever, and I'll stay as long as you need me to, but like that, the ability for you to sit and analyze what are your activities daily and are they actually towards the things that are most valuable in your life right now, um, is really important and being honest with yourself. Cause I was just not being honest with myself on why I was doing what I was doing. Yeah. You know, Tyler, I, I, I didn't know you before I, what was it? A 10 growth really? I mean, we, even before that we met at family for the first time, I think. Um, in person, yeah, family. yeah, in person at family. And what's crazy is I just remember all of that before. I remember all the lives. I remember all the interactions on the groups. And I just remember watching. I didn't know what you were going to speak on at a 10 growth. I just remember watching that. And I sat there like, wow. I didn't realize that you had been through this and running a company and how, how I'm, I'm just saying how intelligent to have hired the right people to keep your business running at a time of being low and them being able to grow it at the same time you step away a little bit is impressive. Um, that's a whole that's a whole episode on its own about being able to, how do you learn how to hire? Um, but, but your lessons from that seem to be amazing about like being able to use the immune system as an analogy for others and investors really trying to pump things into their business and strategize. Um, and I really want to get into that too, because I know a lot of people really love hearing when you talk about the different things that are working in the market, right? And like, and so over the last three years and all of that stuff, you've learned different things along the way. And I know one thing at a 10 growth you really honed in on was being uh, really getting into more marketing, more having that more marketing brain. Um, and one thing for sure we definitely got to cover is the the thing that you realize with you either want a, a real estate company or a sales company and yeah. you really can't do both. And I know we really talked about that. I really want you to explain the differences. Yeah. So, and there's some controversy here and there is like a middle line, right? But generally speaking, there's two types of, you know, uh, real estate companies, right? You're either in the business of real estate, right? A good example is like solar companies. They don't sell, they don't. They're not solar engineers in the sense that like they're designing solar systems and doing the nuances of how to make it better and all this stuff. There is somebody in solar that does that, but the people door knocking you are not those people, right? They are salespeople. Um, and uh, same thing goes with like uh, a lot of different industries, right? In, in real estate. So you're either in real estate in a sales functionality and you build an operation based off or, you know, how many doors I knock is how many I need to get a deal, right? And and it's that simple, right? Um, those operations in themselves um, do have a place in the industry, right? Uh, for sure. Then you have the real estate companies, right? The real estate uh, investment firms or the full service real estate companies. Um, these are people who are looking to build uh, something uh, in their 
in their local communities in uh in their state and they're they're looking to to uh find people who want to sell their house and then service them with a lot of different opportunities right uh be it wholesaling the property flipping the property you know listing the property these people are looking to add brokerages into their into their portfolio title companies um they're looking to get you know they 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 really are are building a real estate firm uh if you will right and and they could specialize in a specific niche just like in the law world you have offices that are just law right uh or or just probate rather right but then you have offices that you know do probate and they they do tax stuff and they do a lot of different things right um and so you can specialize in a specific thing and grow out your specialties in these real estate firms sales companies they don't do that right they don't specialize they just market right they just pay for PPL stuff they do a lot of you know PPC ads and they just they spend a lot of money to generate a lot of leads and they try to sell it as as much as possible to the highest bidder it's very very salesy and um just as quickly as they grow they also have the potential to to pull back as fast right there's a lot of uh, back and forth a lot of roller coaster stuff and and there's people that nail it but the success rate in that is way lower um because of not the fundamentals of how to do it but because of the person leading the operation right um the person that's leading the operation is not designed to be a leader that can lead sales teams and stuff like that so it just takes a lot more to grow those and a lot of people that 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 see those they get super they think they're super sexy and they they put a lot of money into them right away and so they deplete themselves because they don't have they, they don't have enough money to uh, to to maintain it and they don't have the patience uh to uh let that money stack up and and then start building that operation okay real estate investment companies themselves specializing on a niche or building out on top of that and really understanding the core fundamentals of their business um and the KPIs the problems and the problems and hiring the right team members first and having a core amazing team that handles the business that does the business well and then hiring helpers around them um you know those businesses uh what's beautiful about them is it doesn't matter what's going on in the economy right it doesn't matter you know uh what's what niches are hot or not right um they're focusing on consistency and they understand their data really well um most of them are using strategies um you know that other people aren't doing because it doesn't fit the volume metric to get the results right and and so they basically have um their specialties right this is really similar to the people who like only buy from wholesalers to flip right they only do that right that's just what they do right. they don't know anything else they're very niche and they do it very well they have crews and they they're they're really good at that and that's okay um but um the thing is 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 that you got to understand which one you're wanting to build basically like who are you where are you at financially right now do you have kids and no job right now? Do you have a W2? There's a lot of places really. to add yourself in. Yeah. Yeah. No, and and I and I made a note here from when we when we talked about how I mean, it, it you really can't go wrong with either direction that you choose, but you do have to pick one. You do have to hone in on that one. But I know when we were talking, I was like, what's really working right now? And spending a ton of money and being a sales operation is working leads 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 right like that's something that works if you want to be in sales but then on the other side if you want to do real estate i know you had mentioned like be like specialize get into that thing be known for that thing it's going to take years and i and i was thinking of so many different people that are really getting in on with either just wholesaling or flipping or or just getting into land and just following that and and like get into that it's great yeah so like um in that note right the people who are just doing the sales operations it's not that you can't merge these two together because you can right you can build you can build a real estate company that does have an attachment of a sales organization okay these these are the 10 plus million dollar companies that i'm that that i'm talking about here these are the ones that they clearly have a sales organization they also have the brokerage and they are spending a ton of money over here but they have their bread and butter and they mastered that bread and butter very very well be it the sales organization first 
or the, you know, the niche, you know, uh, probates or tax delinquencies or whatever that is, tax, you know, deeds, whatever it is, they mastered that first. And then they started adding in these other things to increase uh, cash flow. Um, and what's interesting about those types of operations is very quickly, can they just turn off one of their departments? They literally will just, if the numbers don't make sense and it's not profitable, like they'll just, they just like turn it off and it just disappears. Right. Right. Um, and this is why right now I'm helping a lot of these bigger operations coming in and saying, Hey, you're right now you are a massive sales operation. Let's add this leg in. You have this cash flow. You're doing well. Let's add this leg of predictability underneath of you. Right. Let's add, you know, a subset into your, into your business and, and be, um, be a little bit more consistent in one thing so that if there is ups and downs, right. In your sales organization, you still have your bread and butter, be it 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, or, you know, hundred thousand dollars a month in that one niche. And so, um, you can also build a niche sales organization in the sense that you can focus solely on probates across the whole nation. That's a lot of data and you can do that as a sales operation. And, and, and so you can start niche, like say I'm in Okaloosa County and I get really good at probates in Okaloosa County. Then I hop over to Jacksonville and I add those and I get really good in Jacksonville. Then I hop down to Tampa and I can become really good and start with Florida and just get a process and a VA that's pulling those every single day. And we're hitting them. We're just smashing them. We have the attorneys on file. We got all that. And then I can hop up into Georgia and then I can hop up in Alabama. Then I can hop up into Texas, right? And I can start expanding this and my processes do have to change, right? I can't necessarily, or I have to have a ton of human beings, right? But things do change as you scale in that. But you, if you do it in the right way, you can have a very massive operation. There's guys that have done this for, for a very long time, right? In, in tax deeds, right? They buy foreclosures and tax deeds and tax auctions across the whole United States. They'll flip it. It don't matter where it's at. They'll flip it, right? Because they're buying right off the market, right? They'll buy right off the MLS. Like, but people can't understand that when you add the data into it, right? This is all oh, that takes work. Like those guys are doing it because it's easy. You just go on there, you bid and that's that. Like, well, no, what takes work is building the process. Maintaining it's a lot easier. The biggest part of the equation is having the right people in the right places executing on those. If you don't have that, then all of it's hard no matter what you're doing, right? Right. Yeah. You don't want to put the wrong people where they're not supposed to be. I mean, you and, and it takes time to find that too, right? Like you have to learn what the strength is of that person or, uh, you know, do the research beforehand, but you do want to make sure that person's there. Otherwise it's not going to work. Um, Tyler, I don't know if I'm getting ahead, but I definitely wanted to make sure we covered the niche sequential marketing too, or, or the first to market niche sequential marketing yeah. and like what the difference is between the two, or maybe it's the same thing, but like, why has that been a huge trend lately? Yeah. So, um, and this is, this is something that people don't fully understand, right? When I, when I talk about this, I, I, I came out with a video in 2021 i think it was maybe early 2021 uh and it was called like the sensei flow for whatever reason this became our most popular video on youtube and now it's like a, a thing you know it's like a marketing strategy the sensei flow right and it has a nice flow to it i mean the name sounds good that's good um but uh, uh um, what it was is when i first started in real estate we we did a lot of click to call right and we focused on um Anybody who was on a very specific scenario, we didn't throw them in a bulk dialer because I was like, why, why do that? They're my most valuable thing, right? I'm not going to get rid of that's like, that's like throwing your family's phone numbers in a bulk dialer to, you know, call them to see if they're doing okay. You're not going to do that. That's kind of, kind of messed up, right? Um, you're going to, you're going to call them, click it, update it, you know, and the biggest analogy that I do with this is I usually grab a piece of paper and I just like, I'll put like, you know, three numbers on it or whatever. And then I'll say like, Hey, ring, ring, ring. Oh, that's the wrong number. I scribble it out. Right. And I annotate next to it. Wrong number. Right. And then, oh, this one, it just beeped. That's a dead number. I just put dead. Right. And so on. So I, I, I give the example that if I was manually calling somebody, I would be scratching it out on a piece of paper and I would be, you know, annotating it. And if I got a correct number, I would save it in my phone probably. Right. Right. Um, and, and so I want to do that same functionality for, you know, the person who just got a list pending notice yesterday, you know, you know, if there's five people yesterday that got a list pending, I want to pull those today. And I want to do that 
call through them in a very manual way. Um, call, text, voicemail, three days in a row. That's 70 or that's um, uh, what, 18 touches or whatever over three days or something like that. Um, on average, it takes between six to 12 touches to get a response. And so strategically, it's you know created in such a way to where if you don't get a response, you know that they're not going to your phone numbers aren't working. Right. So right. you either need a door knock or send mail, you know, whatever else. And this can you know create a rabbit hole of what you should do next. But at any rate, um, that that turned into the actual execution of it is called niche sequential marketing. OK, um, it's no longer called the sensei flow. I just call everything that we do sensei flows. Because it right? sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Like bulk sequential marketing, there's a sensei flow around it. Niche sequential marketing, there's a sensei flow around it, right? So it is like the umbrella now. And then you have um, you have the first to market. What is first to market? Well, it's very simple. It's as it sounds, right? It's being first to market to those people. So instead of waiting to pull it on PropStream in a month from now, instead of pulling it from a, you know, a, a probate company in a month from now or in a week from now or whatever else, like, you have a VA that works in the daytime at their time, nighttime at your time. So in the morning, when you wake up, yesterday's probates are in your account and they're ready to call, right? And and so you're the very first person that's going to be hitting them. So you know who you're not reaching before anybody else, which means that you have the ultimate advantage because now you, but while they're still trying to reach them and, and gain that insight by throwing in a bulk dial or whatever for that specific niche, you've already went through all that and you've already known that, hey, that person's not answering the phone. Uh, we sent them mail. We got a return mail piece. So we're digging in the, in the airs in that scenario. Right. right. And so it's all about having information. And that's what the first to market niche sequential stuff is. It's just about in those specific small niche, we have users. I mean, we have a user doing, you know, 15 foreclosures a day and he's did 2 million last year. We have users that are doing really, really small niche stuff and waiting. They're throwing all the stuff in the bulk dollars and finding all the, the, you know, they're first to market on their own data. So basically they're producing a data set internal to their business and the first to market, as soon as this data set arises, boom, we're digging into it. Right. And so first to market doesn't have to be just from the county from yesterday. It could be, it could be, if this is your resources and all you have, it could be, Hey, Today, new probates popped up in, in PropStream. Let me pull them down. Tomorrow, new probates popped up. Let me pull them down. Because then you're first to market with anybody using probate, which is still a good advantage over anybody else that's using PropStream that's not doing that. right? So it's really just a mindset of being the first person to talk to the person who just got in a problem. right? And, and that's what that is. And, and I think you even, you this is your words. You talked about in order to do a niche down, you really have to narrow your process and choose an initial direction. And being yeah. able to... Uh, get the data and accumulate the data. And I love this too, because this is going to be great micro, Mike. Uh, but what is the only list you can't buy? Oh, yeah, the one that you're creating, right? The only list that you can't buy is the one that you have to create yourself, right? It's the one that's culminated through your efforts of marketing, right? The, the, the real estate investor list to market to for you know all the real estate investors or wholesalers, you know which ones I can't buy unless they let me is the ones from the other coaches, right? That have already done all the marketing and gathered all the email lists. You know how valuable that list is? Huge. I would buy it today. If if you're a coach out there and you have a list of emails for real estate wholesalers and investors, I'll buy it from you today for a nice fee. Isn't I can't, crazy? it would, you know how much it would cost me to gather that? It would cost me tens and thousands, if not a hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce a list, depending on the size. So the only list that you cannot create or buy rather is the one that, that is created in your own marketing. The only thing that makes Dom uh, or G or anybody else in the Jacksonville market uh, have a higher advantage in that market than I do is because they bought the data three years ago and you know continually and they've been calling it for that long a lot of phone numbers you know and they've been in business more than three years but like you know calling through it um sadly in the beginning they weren't tracking those phone numbers right but i believe they are now and um and so if i were to hop over in jacksonville i would have to buy the list and I would have to find all the wrong numbers. I would have to find all the dead numbers. I would have to find all the phone numbers that are not the right number and gather some correct numbers, but I still would not have the advantage over them. 
if their operation is tight and they're following up with those correct numbers that were not interested three months ago, a year ago, three years ago, if they're doing their operation correctly, I would never be able to catch up because they'll always be ahead of me. It's like the runner who has been running uh, three miles a day for 30 years, right? I'm not going to be able to go run three miles better than them today. It's going to take me very, 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 very long time. Now, right. is there other things that I could do to, to have an advantage? You know, yeah, but at the end of the day, I'm still behind. Yeah, and you talked about this too, which is – going through all of this and understanding these different processes is how there's been a huge shift in people wanting to understand what's going on in their business. Like yeah. being able to really hone in on the data and like the crazy story, I'll, I'll let you elaborate of, of, of how you were able to break down some, uh, some investors numbers and, and they're doing millions and they still were leaving millions on the table. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. We have a user. I'm not, I'm not going to disclose their company um, unless they ever come up and say that they'd be cool with it. Most of those like guys doing over 10 million, they don't really like to, they're not flashy people usually, you know? Um, and uh, anyway, they're doing, they're doing a lot of, a lot of uh, um, digits. Right. And um you know, I look at their operation and they're, 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 I mean, they're dialing and SMSing and PPC TV. I mean, they doing everything in order to get to, you know, that many uh, digits, you got to be doing every marketing strategy at volume, right? There's no way you wouldn't be able to, but it creates this, this massive uh, void in problem. It's like, you could be super, like, you know, great example. The example I've been using on, on, on this is the bodybuilder that's on like extreme testosterone right? He looks shredded. He looks super fit, but his heart is just like not very good. Like internally he's, he's dying. Right. Uh, and not on all scenarios, but like, I'm um, talking about like the heavy, heavy abusers or whatever. And I'm not a doctor, but like, um, you know, that's the same thing. Like this business is on the outside, they're cash flow heavy. Um, they're, they're crushing it. Um, and, but they have a lot of systems and processes that are just like, Hey, it's fine because we're vitamin C, you know, vitamin C is taking care of it. Um, and then some things happen in the market. And so they, they start having issues. And, and I'm like, cool, like you're doing a lot of numbers. You're being successful. Let's just look at something. We'll just do the first three steps, which involves uploading a list and a sift, uploading the phone numbers, right, that you've had historically, uploading pulling data down from your dialers and your SMS platforms and updating those phone numbers with the disposition types across the thing, the way, not only do we see that they're losing a ton of money because they weren't focused on a specific niche, but they also were spending double, if not triple the funds because they were the, the, the phone numbers, all their phone numbers were like, they were remarketed to a lot of the dead numbers multiple times in the dialer and the SMS platform. It was just all over the place. Right. Um, anyway, we ended up filtering down by like, okay, cool. All this data that you've had for years, most of it you're not even marketing to anymore, right? Because you, you know, you've moved on to the other stuff. We uploaded it, we did all that effort, and I said, do this now. Mail these people. They were people that they never got phone numbers for from you know 500, 600, 700 days ago. Just a list of all no phone numbers, it's like like 50 or 60 thousand or something like that. Um, and I just filtered by the ones that were still that were vacant, right? that they didn't get phone numbers for, they sent out mail, and boom, they start generating leads from it, right? They texted, they messaged me and are like, hey, yeah, uh, uh, that's crazy. That's been sitting there, right? And then also um, the stuff that they, um, uh, the return mail, they've never processed, right? they're sending 50,000 mail pieces a month, wow. never done anything with their return mail. And doing analytics on that. Right, and, and not only did they do that, but like, they're not, out of that 50,000 that they were sending, right? If it was return mail, like it's not getting removed. So they're resending it the next month, right? And not, and if they, if it became a lead, there was no system in place to remove that from uh, the system. If they got a correct number that was not interested, they never removed it from direct mail. It's way cheaper to follow up on the phone than it is to send a direct mail, mm -hmm. right? So follow up with not interested is on the phone, not like there's just a lot of small things, right? Um, and we were able to cut down their, uh, not only their marketing expenses, but they actually ended up compensating and increasing their revenue because they just put, they had the people for it. They had a, you know, a ton of employees, you know, over 20 employees. And, and so they had the people to be responsible for the processes. They just didn't have the processes in place. 
There's not any extra effort at all. That's the crazy thing. You don't have to do anything more. You just, it actually makes it easier. Upload, click a filter that you pre-created, you know, six months ago and do this with it. You know, it's like, it just becomes very linear. Yeah. And, and this is another thing. I, I, I know a lot of you are watching and taking notes. And anytime I hear Tyler, I'm always taking notes. And the call I had with Tyler a couple of days ago, I definitely took notes because this is a Tyler quote. A, the ability to not necessarily take action on every operation, and you need a team, obviously, but having the information once you need the information, having real business intelligence. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. I mean, you said that, and it, it was like, it was, it made perfect sense. It's a big thing, man. Like, just a lot of people don't understand that. Okay. Like, SIP, for example, is like for the business plan, it's like $2,700 a year. It's, it's not a lot of freaking money. Let's be honest here. Most people will start this business and skip trace, you know, 30,000 phone numbers and spend 2,500 bucks and then not get a deal and then just piss it off and then just go back to their day job, right? $2,700 is not a lot of money. It's the intelligence and it's what we learn. It's our education that allows us to make money. It's what, and, and, and so what's interesting now is we see people in other markets using these same types of strategies that I've been teaching towards doing like a lot of different commercial stuff and niche stuff in commercial and they're even using some of my front words, like deep prospecting, for example. And I'm like, that's my word. It's not coincidental, right? You no one else fucking was saying that. Like, that you didn't just come up with it, you know? Come on now. Uh, we deep prospected him. No, come on. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, a little bit of credit would be nice. That's all. Um, but so if people are reusing these strategies to close, I mean, deals that are, you know, million dollar, you know, transactions. Right. And so they just don't get the fact that it's not about necessarily um, doing all of the things now. There's no way you could, like you just said. Um, but as time goes on, I need to make decisions in my business. And if I don't have the information in front of me to be able to accurately make that decision from from a business intelligence standpoint, then I'm guessing. Right. right. It's like. It's like, like right now, right. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on herbs and everything else for, for, for my, uh, whatever you want to call it. If I didn't have blood work from three months ago and I started taking a medicine, how do I know when I take blood work on October 2nd to see if it's working? How do I know if it is or isn't? I have no idea. And see, most people co like compare that to, well, I know how many dials I made and now I know how many offers I made and how many contracts I got. Like, great. Fantastic. But how many times in your business right now are you having an issue with the dialer and so you fire a VA because you think it's the VA's problem that you're not getting leads, right? You don't know your correct number ratio. You don't know your not answer ratio. You don't know how many not interested um, out of uh, leads of converting from correct numbers. You're not even probably tracking not interested. You're not tracking all these core things to find out if something happens in your business, what is the true underlying problem? right? You got to get the blood work of the business. You got to be able to analyze it and look at, is it within range or not? Do you have a one and a half percent correct number ratio on a bulk dialer? If you do, it should be two and a half to five percent. One and a half percent is really subpar. It's low. It means something's going on with your numbers. Uh, there's a few places that, you know, point the direction to, but I'm not going to know that I needed that until it's too late where I wanted it. Right. And that's where everybody hates. Like, oh, if only hindsight's 2020 is the excuse you like to use, right? Like, no, it's not. I told you fucking three years ago that you should be doing this. And you said, piss off. That's dumb. That's for poor people. And now, like, you want to start doing it because you want to sound sophisticated. And you want to sound like the fuck you know what you're doing instead of just walking in a room and for the last five years to every mastermind. And the only fucking thing you can talk about is, well, my correct, my, my answer rate is, you know, 17% uh, on call tools. Like, congratulations. Like that doesn't tell me anything about your business, right? That doesn't yeah. help anything. Like, like you got to really, if you want to be in this business, you can build business and they can survive. But if you want them to thrive, you got to build these things in the middle. And what we're doing at SIFT is, is really focused around everything we've been working on. Like I said earlier, like we've, we've grown slower. We've built an amazing community that suit, that's a beautiful tribe. Uh, and, you know, with everything I had going on, and still do like I'm super blessed. I'm super grateful that you know we are where we're at, where we're at now. Um, and but we could have grown way faster if I would have just 
went against the grain or went with the grain and, and sold all the shiny stuff and everything else. But now we're at the point, right? We're at this pivotal point now where we have built all the things that we've needed more or less to have this business intelligence, to, to track all these results from the integrations with smart dialer that is like literally one to one. Every dead number that happens in smart dialer comes back and updates REI ISIF real time. If you call somebody on smart dialer from smartphone with REI ISIF, like a lead, like let's say it's a hot lead, like you just got off the phone with sales and then you call them back again on the same number. Our activity log would tell you if they hung, if they like ignored your call, if they press it and said like hang up versus it no answering. Nobody gets to see that. They just think, oh, they didn't pick up. So they keep dialing. Well, I know that motherfucker. Uh, I switched the cuss and I'm sorry that that guy's that guy's not that he's purposely ignoring me. We get to know that. So we've worked really hard on building deep integrations and educating these different things so that we can add now the visual intelligence on the back, uh, you know, visually. And, and these are things that no one wanted to use us before because they, they didn't know if we were a marketing tool or a CRM. But, and, and so we don't have like automatic drip SMS or we don't have KPI dashboards or some of these things. I'm like, yeah, because what we do happens before that. You need to fix all this. None of that stuff's going to be accurate if you don't fix this shit up front first. Right. right. Um, and so we fix that. And we track that. And now we're able to come back in and add these things to just totally give a level of insight and in for a, a level of information that nobody else, no other platform can even fathom to do because no other flat platform is starts at the data. No other platform has the data and ends with updating it deal close for this dollar amount. We track everything in between. And I'm super excited for where the platform's going around that basis of business intelligence. Like there's just so much really cool things we're going to be able to do. I could have hopped on the, the AI bandwagon. I didn't, right? Because most of it's bullshit uh, in the real estate space, but we're going to be able to build some cool shit. I didn't realize how many little integrations you built with REI SIF like that. Like being able to identify, was this a hangout? Was this, uh, did somebody even uh, answer? Or like, you know, every little thing is adding up. And like you talked about, like the importance of people just constantly reviewing their KPIs and 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 just constantly reviewing the data. Like even in my business, uh, I even realized recently when, you know, when things are really busy, it's easy to miss uh, all the little things, right? But yeah. when things are slow, all of a sudden you're like, well, wait, what happened to everything? And so in the last, yeah. you know, last four weeks, it was insane and it slowed down in the last two weeks. I said, wait a second, we need to start building out a spreadsheet. We need to like put the name, the number, who it was, was it, uh, you know, decline, was it not? And being able to review that, follow up, go back and then edit, was it hot, was it cold? And that's what I love about what you've integrated with REI SIFT is being able to do yeah. the CRM stuff, but also the marketing, but then having all these investors do the niche, you know, the deep prospecting and, and, and really honing in on that and being able to do their own marketing the way they want without having to integrate it with different programs and stuff and like like you talked about if you want to do these things it takes a level of due diligence and patience and being able to dive in on that and breaking different like you said avatars down um but making a realistic marketing approach right yeah you gotta you gotta like make a, a marketing approach that fits what you're doing and, and i don't want people to get confused it's not necessarily about only looking at the numbers because if you get too focused on looking at the numbers you're not doing the thing that you should do it's about having enough of the business green thumb if you will to understand that right now where i'm at in business i need to be focusing on just this right and in order to do that it doesn't take much to to track all the results of that so track the results but again don't look at all of it because you'll get hyper focused into looking at all the KPIs. But there's probably only two or three that matters right now. And as long as those are looking good, then go like hard, right? Like you should be dialing most of it. Just go extreme all in on that, get results, and then come back and learn about what happened. You know, but again, you've got to have that information available for you. And so um, and you got to have your team do the same thing or else you don't know how to hold them accountable. And so there's that. Now, you know, a quick advice on like if you're just getting started or, you know, choosing a marketing strategy, you have one of two options right now. 
And it really depends on where you're at in your business. You either have money or you have time, one or the other, or maybe you have a little bit of both. You have a good, you know, stay at home job um, that makes decent money and, and you're smart with your money. Because um, earlier I said, if you were to take one thing from this, this would be the one thing. I scratch that or I compound it with this one. If you're to take anything from this, it's actually that um, your personal finances is actually the most important thing for you to nail in your life. If you don't have that dialed in, like stop, focus, like get it, understand it. What are you intaking? What are you outtaking? I follow a principle in my life, like green daily. That's what it is, right? If I'm not green daily, then I'm, 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 if my net worth doesn't go up, if I, if I spend more today than I did yesterday, if I haven't at least made that much in one day, I can't spend it in a day. Right. Yeah. Um, and so like understanding and treating your money right, because once you do start making it, it can go away very quickly um, if you don't. So that's that's also a really big, important thing um, in your business. And I'm talking about in your business, what can happen is you can you put money in your business, you fund it, you get a deal from one of these strategies I'm about to mention. And then all of a sudden you make 30 grand and you blow it on skip tracing or direct mail all at once. Right. Or whatever. Like you, you got to have the, the, the intelligence to, and the patience to use that money. And just cause you just made it don't mean you spend it. You put it in the bank, go make it again, the same way you did the first 30. And then, okay, now I think I got it. I know what's going on. And it took the same amount of time. It didn't take triple the amount of time. Um, and then I could do something more. And so anyway, um, you go out there and look at your competitors, right? Um, I'm, I'm a, for those that, you know, I, I didn't mention in the beginning or whatever, but like I'm a hacker by trade. Right. And, um, and so I believe in stealing information. It's kind of just like, you know, a, a really useful tool when you, when someone else already did the work for you. Right. Um, which is a beautiful thing about the SIF community because everybody there is doing which works. Right. So just go in there and just copy it. Um, but anyway, um, your deals are closing all the time in your market. Go get the last 10 from your biggest competitor. If you're in Jacksonville, go to uh, G's or Dom's website, either one, and, and, and look at their last you know, 10 transactions. What's the average house age? What's the average uh, bedroom and bath? What's the average uh, age of ownership? Right? What are these different averages? And then create an avatar from it and pull that list. And then upload the SIF, skip trace it in SIF, send it from SIF to smart dialer, uh, and start just call through it and do that. And as you call through it, you're going to be producing what I call exhausted owners. Those exhausted owners um, are phone numbers that are all wrong or dead or not the correct number, basically, but every number contains, you know, one of these things. And that record, you're going to dig into it. So you're going to dial for three to five hours a day, and then you're going to dig into those if they exist. Um, and then in the meantime, you're going to go figure out how to pull probates in Jacksonville so you can send out some business. <laughs> um, right. Uh, and then, uh, you can also do the other thing. You could do the probate first, right? You could focus on a probate, get that process dialed in get where you're pulling them daily, uh, digging in and really delve into that. How do I find errors and all that stuff and really nail that in document it and own it, right? Send your resources. If someone doesn't want to sell their house today, the big things with probates is they're, you cannot market the probates in the same way you mark the absentee owners. You can't market to them and say, um, fantastic. Uh, you don't want to sell your house. All right, great. And then move on to the next one. You, you can't use the 50 dials to one contract or 50 leads to one contract ratio type DS. It's all about correct number to a family member and maintaining that relationship for when they're ready to sell. Not interested is the money maker in probates, right? And so um, you want to follow up with the not interested with probates. And so really what you want to do is track deceased Two, family member contacted. What's that ratio? What's that percentage? If you get 50 of them a week, are you getting 25% of them, 50% of them, 75% of them? And you want to try to increase that number and build a whole lot full of that. And then there's a bunch of other stuff you can do to really refine that process. But once you have that dialed in, you know, it might take you a month, two months, three months. Um, a really easy thing to supplement that while you're doing probates is evictions in the state of Florida or in most states, evictions filed at the at the court mm. um, has the phone number to the homeowner on the eviction. Right. And so it's a 100 percent correct number ratio uh, because uh, it's there now. They don't all answer. Some of them are um, are uh, property managers. Right. Some of them are attorneys in the state of Florida. If it's under an LLC, you can't file your own eviction, which is dumb. Um, you have to use an attorney. Uh, but uh, 
anyway, that's a really good one. I have a user. Um, he's in uh, uh, Oregon, I think. Started 90 days ago. I said, dude, just focus on this location, this location, probate evictions, right? And the dude closed uh, 40K so far. And the first thing he messaged me is like, dude, um, how do I scale now? Should I buy, like get an SMS? Should I do this? I'm like, dude, do the same thing and prove you can do it. Be patient. Prove you can make another 40 grand in the next 90 days. And if you do, you got 80 grand, right? And Amazing. half of the time frame it took you to make the rest. And one of those deals could be a hundred grand deal for all you know. And like, he's got a whole pipeline now and, and, and it's all from just like niche first to market. That's it. He's at the point now where it would make sense for him to pull the, the list I mentioned before, add that into the equation and start generating some of those leads. And the reason why, and, this, and I'll end on, on this, um, is, is if someone died today, I'm going to get first to market, right? But if someone died 10 years ago, they're not going to be on my first to market. So what list would they be on? They're going to be on that opportunity list, the one with the 30 years of ownership from 1950 to 1980, three beds, two baths. They're going to be contained on that list. Um, and 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 so I still want to call through that. And that's why it's called the opportunity one, because I don't want to miss the opportunities that lie in that data set, because all the bulk dial in people are going to be on that list. And I want to get a hold of them faster than they are. Um, because it's going to produce opportunity like the ones that are fully exhausted. And that's the main reason I'm calling that list is because the fully exhausted ones from there are usually, usually people that died 10, 15, seven years ago that the, they don't have the family members. So the property has been sitting forever. So no one's contacting anybody. And so those are great ones to dive into, um, or they had family members. They don't know that they died or whatever the scenario. So there's just gems in those yeah right and uh and we have a lot of users uh that focus on those i think uh um uh it's probably one of our more popular niches is like tax delinquent probate or you know age of ownership and exhausted owners um stuff like that yeah you speak my language man i mean like people ask like you can find a probate in this you can find a probate in the you you mean the property's been sitting there for 20 years and it needs probate like how did nobody know there's so mm -hmm. many people that have no idea about these properties yeah. land sitting in i mean a popular one highlands county back in the 80s 90s when they subdivided all the lots and people were doing all the tv auctions and buying just whatever and they said oh i'm going to eventually build a house on this later on and then they never did they died and the family in oregon or washington has no idea you reach out to them there's so many gold mine opportunities and like exactly like Tyler's talking about. You got to hone in on that and be able to really find your rhythm with it. Instead of getting in this like fantasy about doing all this stuff, get, find it again, do it again, narrow it down, hit it again. And like all this data is out there. It's just like what he's talked about on the show. You really just have to hone in on that and analyze your data, go back, review it. What's working, what's not being able to look at the integrations that he has. And if anybody Hasn't heard about REI SIF. I mean, look, it's on the Al Nicoletti show shelf. I mean, I, once I got the sticker, I was like so excited when I was at a 10 growth and Tyler had on his table the stickers. I was like, dude, I need one of those right now. We're putting it right on the shelf. I mean, I, I believe in it. I believe because I know the users, the users find probates. They they find things. So, I, I mean, if you have any question about it, you know, check it, check out the group, the community group on Facebook. And um, you got the owner right here. You got the founder. So, I just want to say, Tyler, it, I mean, epic episode. I mean, we we dove in on uh, your journey and then all the stuff that you're finding that's really like hot in the market and all the tips and things. And I know for sure. I mean, we had so much fan interaction from your group, people that are watching it. I love Teresa. I love that she's watching. You know, we're live. We were live tonight. Um, I mean, we got so many people. Thank you, Beth. She said, uh, you guys look great. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. And we and we just have a lot of people that are that are crushing it out there, like Dan McDuffie. I mean, Dan's killing it. Um, he's doing great stuff. So, I mean, you have people that really know how to hone in on all this stuff. And I can't see who it is, but somebody said a lot of people are feeling the consequences of failing to follow Tyler's advice. He's been preaching this for years. I think it was the niche sequential marketing, the sensei flows. Yeah, that's that's uh, Chris Ailman. He's out of Orlando, actually. Oh. Chris, another one that's killing it. Uh, in, in crushing it. Crushing. Yeah. I mean, let's and go. His expenses are so damn low. He is, I'm not going to give away his secrets on, on air, but dude, he is, he is annihilating it for what he, what he's doing. It's, it's, it's remarkable. 
It's great, Chris. You're killing it. I love it. Um, and then Will, he said, phenomenal content is expected from both of these two. Thank you. Uh, we, you know, I bring on the best. Look at this, Tyler. I mean, you know, he knows how to let it rip and uh, tells it all. So, Tyler, I, I we could. I would love to even have an episode one day on you explaining on how you hire people and how you found the right people in your business that are able to let it run when you can step back if you have family things going on. I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole thing. I think about hiring. I think about all that stuff and finding the right people all the time. But I just want to say like, I'm, I'm impressed with what you're doing in the business. I love what the users say about REI SIFT. I personally know the REI SIFT users that are crushing it. So keep killing it out there, man. Love it. Hope it grows. And uh, as I do on the end of the Al Nicoletti show, I do a segment for the guest that's called final words, final thoughts. It could be one word. It could be two minutes. I just want it to be something that you want to leave the users and the guests with that just is impactful. So as I do on the end of the Al Nicoletti show, final words, final thoughts, Tyler Austin. Mm. I have so many things that are important to me that I want in, for other people to it to be important to them. Um, so I guess the, the only thing that, that I'm going to leave you guys with is uh, – Go be comfortable being alone in your thoughts. I like that. I'm going to leave you with. I like that one. Epic. And it's right there. Tyler, I hope to see you soon. I'll see you at family. I know that for sure. Yep. I'll see you uh, at family. I'll see you at family. And uh, it's going to be a great time. Thanks for coming on again, man. Thank Dude, you. Thanks for, for inviting me, man. Pleasure to be the, the first of the fourth season, man. Yeah. I mean, you know, we wanted to bring a banger. We did it and we got him. So, Tyler. We'll catch up soon. Thank you again for coming on the show and dropping gems in your whole journey again. 100%. Thanks, Al. All right, guys. Take care, man. All right, everybody. If you missed any of the episode with Tyler Austin, you have to go back and check that out. From Tyler's journey, since the last time we had a podcast episode together three years ago, what he went through in the last three years, personally, business-wise, and then jumping in on what's been really working in the market right now. Huge stuff that you want to pay attention to, especially when deals may be slow or maybe things are different in a market and being able to track your data, uh, keep keep uh, keep a data sheet or really get in on all the things with CRM and marketing like REI SIFT does. Again, like I told Tyler, I personally know people that use REI SIFT and that have had success with it and they're crushing it in their markets, whether they're niching down hard, whatever they're doing, it's working. So that's why we bring on the best of the best and Tyler is the best. So I love it. And I just want to leave you all because I, I realized I didn't even do opening thoughts. I was like, wait a second. We haven't been on a while. <laughs> I forgot. I got to do it. So I have final words, final thoughts, Al Nicoletti. And one thing, you know, once in a while, I, I think of something just because it just hits me. All of a sudden, the thought comes in, and I learned this from Nicholas Nick. I give Nicholas Nick credit from Family Mastermind. I remember he said it in one of the groups. He was like, man, a thought comes to my mind. I write it down immediately because as soon as that thought leaves, it's out. And I thought, wow, I feel, I feel like I relate to that. And I thought of something one day, and I wrote this down. And I wrote, everything can teach you something. Everything. It's a matter of whether you, you're willing to accept that understanding, absorb it, and later apply it to other circumstances. And I, and I wrote that down. I'm thinking it's so true because even just take Tyler's episode, his journey, what he's been through, what he's done with marketing. You can learn something about something from anything he said. You can learn about something from someone else's mistakes, your own mistakes, and you can really when, once you truly absorb it and you apply it is when it really comes to fruition. So I just want everybody to know you can learn something from everything, the episodes, the guests, their past experiences, and anything you go and do in your business every day and from other people. So I want to leave you with that. And with that, we will see you next week, Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern. You don't want to miss it. RJ Bates and Cassie are coming on the show. Another electric episode. I'll see you all next Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Have a great night, everybody. Take care.